Welcome to Places and Spaces Community Talk with me, Leslie Stovall. Today, I'll be speaking with Donald Frazier, CEO of BOSS, Building Opportunities for Self-Sufficiency, and their mission to help unhoused people and fight the root causes of poverty. What model that, that makes you so successful? Well, because everybody, you know, not everybody, but the big, big problems with homelessness, housing, you know, kids not going to school, crime and all that kind of stuff. And you guys just keep chugging along. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we keep chugging along. I mean, we, um, you know, we have the three shelters, our uh, family shelter and single shelter in Berkeley and our uh, safe haven uh, shelter in uh, Oakland and then our South County homeless shelter in Hayward. And how many, wow, how many people um, do they hold the homeless? Well, we we also have uh, the community cabins in Oakland on Wood Street, and then we have the RV State Parking. So it's a total of about 287 beds uh, uh, in the system. Uh, That includes the cabins, the safe parking, uh, the um, um, family shelters, and the single shelters that we have. It's about 289 beds. And I know everybody's grateful who's in one of those for sure, because that's that's like a basic human need to have shelter and, you know, a little teddy bear with you at night. Why not? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and then, of course, we have our um, our supported independent living, permanent supportive housing. Um, we have uh, uh, 10 units um, in, in Oakland, another 10 units in Hayward, our Pacheco Court. So does Boss oversee all these houses and the, and the clients and whatnot. And yes. Then, and then how long do they get to stay in these, these uh, domiciles? Well, it's until they get permanently housed primarily. Right. Mm-hmm. So they would have access to um, and be in the shelters until they actually get housed. And so our job, our role is to certainly um, meet them where they are, um, make sure they're nourished and fed uh, and have, um, access to uh, uh, hygienic needs and showers. And uh, we have uh, housing navigators there to help them get uh, what we call document ready, which means an ID and uh, help them get an income um, so that they could then be housed. And uh, so they could be there until that happens for them. You've got a method, a tried and true method to get people off the street. Well, I mean, here's a, here's the here's the issue though. Um, I I think some of it is like we look sometimes we look on the surface because we see this human being laying in the middle of the street, and then we can have all kind of assumptions about it. Is it mental health? Is it substance use? You know, and but they're basically in the living on the street. And I think if we kind of looked uh, higher up, uh, more on a global scale, and look at the systems that are involved in terms of how this happens and how it continues to happen and look at the systems that are involved with this uh, just in terms of in the bay area how much it costs to rent a place to live uh, let alone buy some buy a place to live then you look at the um, issues around employment and people will say well you don't get a job any job and just work and and people do that and then at a minimum wage and you're making enough. You can't make enough money on minimum wage to um, let, to pay for rent uh, in the Bay Area. It's just impossible. And that means, okay, should we have subsidies for people to offset their rent? Should we create a universal subsidy uh, program for people uh, under a certain amount of uh, income who would then be guaranteed uh, housing with that subsidy? I say yes. Then you look at this fact of there's just not enough housing uh, around for people, right, to to be housed. Uh, and then even if you look at the the systems involved with the funding sources or the people who are responsible for um, housing folks who are homeless and poor and disabled, city departments are responsible for that, a county or a state. What uh, the city is basically responsible for the people who live in their city, but the county bears responsibility as well. The state bears responsibility and the federal government bears responsibility. But some of the, and I say this a lot to people, a lot of the legislative and administrative uh, policies that are involved in these programs 
are create barriers uh, for the people we serve, right? And why why is that? They they don't have lobbyists. <laughs> Absolutely, there's, no <laughs> there's certainly no lo poor people's lobbyists to speak on their behalf. And and I think that the one of the challenges is I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, so they're saying that HUD created a mandate of with um, coordinated entry. And basically what coordinated entry does is just a data gathering mechanism uh, where the city and the county and the state will know, have a lot of information on homeless people. Mm -hmm. It does nothing in terms of housing people. Now they say it's a prioritization process where the person with the highest need will be elevated to the top of the list and then qualify for permanent supportive housing that's available. Who's making these decisions? And Donald, I, I want to reintroduce you because um, you've been talking so greatly. This is Donald Traver, the executive director of BOSS, Building Opportunities for Self-Sufficiency. I love that. You've been around for 50 years. Not 50 you years. Over 50 <laughs> yes. And, yes. And, and how does, um, I want to ask you some questions more about BOSS here. Couldn't you talk about the Wellness and Empowerment Campus? Because that, that's everybody needs that. Absolutely. Now that's uh, that's my uh, that's my baby. That's my yeah. our dream, right? That we, you know, one of the things that we did when I first got here, um, uh, and I I was hired at Boss in 2013, January of 2013, and we did an environmental scan, both external and internal. And internally, we had to create infrastructure to support the work. And then externally, externally, we wanted to see what the community actually needed and what we were actually doing in the community that made a difference. What we came back with, and we, you know, we got a, some uh, evaluators and some interns from UC Berkeley and kind of made a project of it, right? We did some asset mapping, uh, surveys, uh, kind of really looked into this. What and, was asset uh, well, survey? Well, asset mapping is just finding out uh, the um, an, an example is if you want to know how many grocery stores are in uh, Berkeley, you would do an asset map to find out all the grocery stores in Berkeley. If you wanted to say and find a specific neighborhood or a specific district to see what services are available in a specific district, um, whether it's a supervisory district, a city council district, um, a zip code. Um, um, a, a census tract. And so it's just to find information around um, resource for us anyway. We used it to find information around resources in certain areas uh, in Alameda County. And what we found out was there's a what we call uh, a poverty, crime, violence, and incarceration corridor that goes from South Berkeley through West Oakland, East uh, Central Oakland, East Oakland, Deep East Oakland, Ashland, Cherryland, and South Hayward. Now, we do business all across Alameda County. We're in Berkeley, we're in Oakland, we're in Hayward, we're in Cherryland, Ashland with our uh, transitional age youth programs, and we're in Hayward, in South Hayward with our shelters. And that was... Um, uh, that was a, a, an enlightening moment for us where we actually found where the poverty was, where folks were coming back uh, when they were being released from jail and prison, the majority of them, right? Don't so the majority of the part. Hmm? Don't they go back home, you know, where they live? Well, home, yeah, home is in that those areas, though. So yeah. home is, is in that along that corridor that we talked about where the par the majority of poverty is, the majority of the crime is, which is the where the majority of people who are released from prison and jail return home to, right? It's all along that corridor, right? And so if you kind of kind of do the math, like the it's a toxic mixture, right? In it's in terms of people's environment. Circular firing squad, you know, it sounds like um, absolutely. Well, and so I was going to say, where where is, was the highest crime rate and poverty in the, along that section? It's uh, in East Oakland. Is that the highest yeah. homeless area as well? Uh, yeah, homelessness is kind of countywide, but I would say Oakland being ground zero for homelessness, crime, and violence. Uh, homelessness is throughout the city of Oakland. I think concentrated, more rev prevalent in areas of concentrated poverty which happens to be 
uh, East Oakland, yeah. But I, I want to talk about our Wellness Empowerment Center, right? Oh, yeah, right. Campus, yeah, the, the our Wellness and Empowerment Campus, right? So we 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 felt and, and kind of going back to the environmental scan that I talked about earlier and we came back with the with the data and so we felt that we need to get closer to the people right and and the people in the communities where the need and where the highest need is and by far uh black and brown people are disproportionately living and have been living in persistent poverty for uh more than six decades or more any statistics on the, the raw numbers? Well, yeah, you say uh, the black African American black population, uh, probably around twenty four percent living below poverty. Um, Latinx about eighteen percent, and white people are about eight percent um, living below poverty. That's in Alameda County, so that's a poverty statistic. Um, so yeah, I mean it's it's very real. I was going to say, how do you allocate resources with, with so many intertwining problems? What what goes first, the cart or the horse? Yeah, well, I think there's there's um, uh, the cart or the horse. Great, <laughs> let me just say, great question, right? But I, I I would say I would phrase it a different way. I would say, well, the highest need population. I think re the resources need to be allocated where the highest need is. Uh, hands down, right? Full stop. And then you say, okay, what kind of resources? Well, if we look at uh, where uh, the, what the situation is for different groups of people and why different groups of people are in the situations they're in, and then look at the co conditions that have been created in those environments where those specific people live, uh, you kind of come up with... Uh, a formula of, well, we need economic development, we need housing uh, development, we need um, uh, safe schools, right, safe parks, and how do we kind of just create that, right? right? So, and if you look at communities of opportunity as opposed to disinvested communities, and these same communities along that corridor that I talked about have been disinvested over years, like right? Like decades, decades. Well, yeah, decades, absolutely decades, and um, m more than six, more than six or seven decades, uh, real quickly, right? So, listen, after World War II, uh, the uh, um, the Veterans Administration uh, and the FHA, uh, Federal Housing Administration, uh, gave out loans to people after the war. This before and after the war. Now, granted, you, you have to understand the great migration of Black folks who were coming from the South, uh, getting away from that torturous uh, uh, system of, of slavery and Jim Crow, where they're coming from the South to the Northern cities. For work. Looking for some kind of respite and work. And, um, and so before the war and after the war, they gave out loans, the federal government gave out loans primarily 95% or more to white people. Is this and, part of the GI Bill? Is this well, part of the GI it was, Bill? It, yeah, it was part of the GI Bill, but it was actually, yeah, through the Veterans Administration and then the uh, the um, FHA as well, right? Okay. So so the, the idea was to build a middle class, right? They, it, it was this whole idea uh, after the war to build a thriving middle class. And the, it was about uh, giving loans to people to create that middle class but uh, but the majority of loans went to white folks and then you know then you had the redlining then you had the blockbusting then you had the urban development uh um urban renewal right where they were just creating eminent domain and say in oakland along uh, uh west oakland where the bart station where the bart is now they demolished and just uprooted an entire thriving black neighborhood to create the bart uh, transportation. They, uh, the the 980 freeway was created to do an over, so the folks can drive over West Oakland and not drive through West Oakland. That's exactly the, 880, right. the 880 and the 580 freeways were deliberately designed to separate folks. And then, uh, you know, they say living below the freeway and above the freeway. Well, wealth is above the freeway. Poverty is below the freeway. Right, right. Uh, very strategic moves, right? And so this is, and and then you look at the a lot of uh, inequities with psychosocial 
uh, um, uh, um, inequity, which means mental health and substance use and access to, to that. Primary care and who uh, the populations who are suffering uh, um, uh, on that. Um, so if, let, me, let me put it this way. If you look at uh, medical care and with the populations, just like black folks are 24%, 24% of black folks are living in deep poverty as opposed to 8% of white folks. And then you look at the medical care, we are at the bottom, at, we're at the bottom of every health category uh, in terms of morbidity and mortality rates. African-Americans? Uh, African-Americans, we're at the very bottom, right? And I, I say that, uh, and there's, you know, and when you when you start talking about, okay, what's why is this happening? What what's the reason for this? Well, it's systemic racism, right? It's 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 structural racism. That's the only excuse for it. How you can explain the inequities that have occurred over time and continue to incur, occur, and the level of disinvestment in certain communities. Um, uh, and this is not just in Alameda County and in Oakland. This is across the country. I mean, what we do here at Boss. I mean, and my my statement in, in all of that is what I'm trying to say. In all of that is, it's a large problem, right? And it's it's a national problem, right? It's a a Western civilization problem. And I mean, listen, Boss is a small organization. We're here in uh, Alameda County. We we do our best to bring uh, comfort and respite to people, to uh, help them get to the next level. But listen, we're so far downstream. I think most nonprofits uh, are so so far downstream, uh, trying to just provide survival uh, uh, resources to human beings, right? We know we created the Wellness Empowerment Campus with the idea of uh, creating a, a career training, employment, and housing center where we have employment education services, which include job readiness and uh, job placement, education and career pathways, career coaching, uh, education, GED, high set, uh, community college, and CalFresh and Medi-Cal, um, uh, or uh, getting folks uh, on Medi-Cal and CalFresh, and then we have our housing services uh, for interim housing, um, rental assistance, uh, housing navigation, case management, and then critical time intervention once people are housed to make sure that they're stabilized in their housing. And on that, that's our career training, employment, and housing center. And then we also have our violence prevention and intervention center where we provide gun and gang violence services, uh, community healing services, and gender-based violence services. And then we have our trauma recovery center where we provide behavioral health services. And then we had to, uh, and all of this is going to be at uh, Eastmont Town Center at 7200 Bancroft in Suite 85. Was that the Eastmont uh, Mall? Yes, Eastmont Mall. Okay. Yeah. Now, older. yeah, <laughs> yes. And uh, we, uh, we're, it's rem being remodeled. Uh, and so we're a little bit displaced, but our folks, our violence prevention folks are in a unit uh, 266 in the mall. And our employment services are right now in, are in West Oakland at 22811 Adeline. But we're all going to uh, move into Eastmont when the renovation is complete in December. Well, let, let and us know. I said, let us know so we can cover it. Absolutely. That Absolutely. And then our, we'll also have behavioral health services there as well. So mental health, substance abuse, we're try, we're putting together a um, domestic violence classes for individuals. And then we uh, the 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 cherry on top of the cake is that we uh, got funded to uh, open a trauma recovery center, and that's going to be at seventy five oh one East Fourteenth for old school Oaklanders, <laughs> but uh, for seventy five oh one International Boulevard. Uh, for new school, but um, the and the trauma recovery center will provide uh, psychosocial and psychoeducational services, uh, psychiatric evaluations, care coordination, counseling, mental health, substance use, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, and a host of other uh, services geared toward uh, survivors of crime. Right, and that's the purpose of the recovery center is well, to provide services to survivors of crime. Before we go any further, I do want to 
introduce you to the audience once again. This is Donald Frazier, the ED of BOSS, uh, Building Opportunities for Self-Sufficiency. And uh, by way of disclosure, I did some uh, emceeing for the shows and for the fundraisers. And I have to say, everyone was just so happy. And I don't mean silly happy, but just like, you know, confident and looking forward to their lives. These children, it was so wonderful. I mean, some of these children grew up in a car. Okay, and they're getting four point and going to college and getting housed. Yeah. It, it doesn't get better than that. Yeah, and thank you for that, Leslie. That was that's amazing. Always amazing seeing you, talking with you, and certainly when you uh, uh, come and uh, do the emceeing for the Rising Stars event uh, that you're talking about. And you know how that came about. So no, I don't. So I came to Boss again in uh, 2013, and uh, we have our family shelter. And I would go over there and talk with the young people. And uh, we have our CLC, our Children's Learning Center, which is an after-school program for them. Wonderful. And I was just start imagining to myself, uh, what would it be like being homeless and being a teenager? God. And going to school and trying to um, study and you know do well, and then being homeless. And what it's kind fantastic. of weight, what kind of weight would that have? on me so i came back to the office we uh in one of our executive uh, staff meetings just asked everybody to just go around the room and talk of just imagine if you were homeless and you're a teenager like what like what, you know if 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 we could even imagine it and but i think the and so what we said was listen we need to just start celebrating them we need to start shining some light on them get get to know who they are and highlight their lives and highlight them in a way not for uh, like the science projects where folks, young kids are building rockets to the moon or whatever, but how their uh, social and emotional, um, where their social and emotional strengths are. Uh, some of them are doing extremely well uh, who are leaders in their families, uh, leaders in the community, uh, doing very uh, uh, interesting things in their life. And we don't know about that. So we parted up with... Um, Berkeley High School with, uh, of course, Boston and uh, Berkeley Youth Alternatives, and then uh, um, the um, uh, uh, Berkeley Academy Technology, I'm sorry, Technology Academy. And you get a lot of uh, local support from businesses, I know. I mean, it was a community yeah. event. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely, your, yeah. Your credit is beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Political uh, uh, folks came. Uh, Nancy Skinner uh, from the state Senate came, uh, the mayor, city council members, um, businesses. And we, uh, you know, I'll tell you, we, there was this young man, and this was years ago, this is 2014, our first one. His name was Kyle. And Kyle wanted to be a, um, Kyle wanted to be a uh, uh, pediatric surgeon. Wow. And uh, exactly. <laughs> That's what I said. And he wanted to go to Brown University. Now, this is a young man in his uh, teenage years. I think he was a junior at the time. Why but did his he dream was to Brown? Why? I have no idea, but that's where he wanted to go. And we were 100% supportive. Well, long story short, he got into Brown University. He graduated. He went to medical school. And he is a pediatric surgeon today. So that was, that's what, 10 years ago? Oh, my goodness. Um, nine, nine years ago, yeah. But you know what? Yeah. It's like everybody has some 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 kind of like if you're if you're a good coach, right? You mm -hmm. evaluate the talent and put people in in situations where they can succeed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and you guys do that twenty four seven. I, I'm I'm just off the moon about your your uh, because it's it's not paternalistic. It's it's just treating them like dignified people. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Kyle was uh, sleeping in his car and uh, with his parents that drove up from Georgia. They were sleeping in the car. Uh, we took them in at our Pacheco Court facility in, in uh, Hayward. And um, and he was one of our first rising stars. <laughs> and uh, his story is amazing. And he he's uh, uh, doing very well now. You know, I, that's so good to hear. And, and in the future, if you would like, if you would give me a call and we could interview some of the, your clientele and let them tell their story and inspire people yes. worldwide. I would yes, 
lecture and they'll do much better job than me. I, I'll, I'll, be more than, I'll be more than happy to, uh, to have them come on. Yeah, it, I mean, I keep saying it, but I've never seen a group of, my mother was an MSW and she ran a community center and had healthcare and all that kind of stuff. And it reminded me of her place because people were well taken care of and were proud to be there and were successful. You know, Amazing. Getting, well, getting skills. Yes. Thank you for that. Well, you know, we can't we can't go without talking about our 50th anniversary that's coming up. Tell me now, what are you guys going to do? What's happening? I want to go. Yeah, please do. So we are having, uh, you can go to the uh, bossbayarea.org. Uh, that's our website and click on the 50th anniversary and get ticket sponsorships, which is going to be on October 26th, uh, a couple of weeks at, that's going to start at five, to five o'clock at uh, block 15 in Oakland, 252 second street in Oakland. Okay. Block 15. Block 15. Well, we'll be there. So uh, just one, one last question, Donald. You know, this, the uh, robberies and all the stores and the takeover of stores, what, what, what do you, why do you think that's happening? Um, great question. I, I, I'll say this, and I get this question a lot, a lot, a lot in, in different areas, but it's like, why do you think this, why did this domestic violence rate so high? Why is the homeless problem so intense? And then why are the robberies happening? And um, I, I think that we uh, have to kind of take a step back and say, okay, what what are we doing? What How are the systems creating situations like this? Um, and I think um, certainly people need to take personal responsibility. There's no doubt about that. That, that plays a role in it, but it's not 100% uh, of the solution in terms of people taking personal responsibility. How do we as... A community. How do we, as a system, uh, create opportunities uh, uh, and, and, and structures for people to learn, grow, um, and and uh, um, uh, understand the value of things uh, and the value of themselves? So, I mean, I think there's a there's been a breakdown of you know a spiritual connection. A lot of young folks are not going to church i mean and and not that church is everything but i know that um for um african americans the church was all we had uh, uh before and now it's really meaningless to a lot of young people um just and not church but the, the spiritual a spiritual connection i think that the system has created kind of an untenable um um, type of, uh, you know, when, when we talked about like the expense of living, uh, when we talk about uh, the onset of social media and the onset of um, this, this need to have and need to be somebody, um, uh, you know, the, the likes on social media, I think there's a combination of things that, that, bring things together that, um, you know, create, you know, opportunities for people to make bad decisions. Social media encourages lack of impulse control. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And then also yeah. the includes uh, narcissism, all this kind of stuff. Cause you see, like I was watching this clip on television and somebody was getting beat up in the subway in New York. And so, and so usually somebody might help or something. People just started taking pictures. Yeah. Yeah. And and I'll say this. I think that there is, uh, I don't think that represents the majority of the population. I think that is certainly part of what's happening. I think if the people who are concerned about this, I think we have to find a way that we can all come together and then combat, combat that. So when something is happening, either we turn away, say, glad it wasn't me, or that's a terrible thing that happened. Uh, and I think if just from a participatory uh, act, if, quote unquote, the good folks ha took a stand together to say, hey, listen, we've had enough of this, whether that's violence in our communities, whether that's crime on the streets, um, whatever the case may be, 
I think a collective of folks who have had enough will override that. And I think, uh, you know, to come together and create uh, responses and solutions uh, to the problem. Uh, because a lot of this is, you know, I say there, but for the grace of God, go I, um, or my children or my grandchildren uh, to get caught up in some kind of, um, just to get caught up in right? anything. Uh, in anything, absolutely, right? And then what are we doing about it? What am I doing about it? Okay, I'm the CEO of a nonprofit. We do some great work. We're in the community. And that's not, that may reach someone who may have, was thinking about going and committing a crime or committing an act of violence. And maybe we stop that from happening. And that's kind of hard to prove, right? right. The, most hard, the hardest thing to prove is prevention, right? How you prevented something from happen, happening. But I think the work in itself is meaningful because, yeah, there's a high probability that we did, that we certainly did. That's based on, hard. Yeah, based on the individuals that we deal with and the communities that we work in. But it's not enough. It's not enough. I think that, uh, I think churches need to step up. I think more nonprofits need to be uh, interested. I think the the whole idea around, um, um, I don't know, I mean, listen, a crime is a crime, right? And 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 people need to be held responsible for that. Absolutely. But then, but then the question it begs the question of, okay, what happens with that individual once? Okay, they're arrested, they're put in jail. Now what? Like, what was right. the underlying? What was the underlying issues for them uh, to to make that decision and to go in that direction anyway? Um, and and so I um. Yeah, it's it's a tough it's a tough question to answer, a tough nut to crack, uh, Leslie. But I think it's multi layered. Yes. Well, listen, we I thank you so much. Uh, we've taken up so much of your time, Mr. Fraser, and uh, I look forward to your success in the future. And I would I would love for you to come back. Thank you so much. I'd love to come back as well. Okay, you, you just let us know. Okay, thank Absolutely. you, Donald Fraser, Boss Organization, doing great work globally. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.